Hi, welcome to ECNM Tech Talks. This is a series of how-to videos where we cover everything from basic electrical theory to the codes and standards that, that uh, govern our installation and maintenance requirements and so forth, on to looking at some of the individual equipment itself and, and uh, some of its peculiar characteristics or how it might be installed or whatever. So anyway, welcome. This uh, Tech Talks video is brought to you by ECNM Magazine. That's Electrical Construction and Maintenance Magazine. And if you haven't already, you need to go to the ECM website. That's ecmweb.com. So ecmweb.com. And when you click on that, in the upper left-hand corner, there's going to be a, a drop-down menu. And what you want to go ahead is click on that menu. And, and when it comes down, the very first thing that you're going to see is premium content. And so you need to click on premium content and sign up for premium content. It's free and there'll be tons of information on uh, that can help you out in the field, whether it's webinars, articles, videos like this one and other types and so on, but plenty of opportunities for you to learn more about our trade. So anyway, I'm Randy Barnett. I'll be the facilitator for today's uh, tech talk. My background is I'm an electrician by trade, a journeyman electrician. Uh, I got involved in the... Uh, primarily mostly industrial type work and got involved in uh, writing articles and books and doing webinars and so on and so forth. So here I am today to talk about theory. We're going to talk about electrical theory of all things. I know. And you go, oh, not theory. I had that a long time ago. Well, why do we need to know anything about theory? For one thing, I think as a professional, we need to understand how things work, right? That's true if uh, think of a professional car mechanic. They know more than just about tuning up a vehicle or fixing a radiator leak or whatever. They probably know a lot about that engine. It's a passion farm, isn't it? And the same is true, I think, when it comes to the world of electricity. You know, we wouldn't have our codes and standards if electricity didn't work the way that it did. In other words, if people didn't get shocked by electricity, we wouldn't need the GFCI protection requirements in 210.8 and throughout the National Electrical Code. If electricity didn't burn down buildings, we wouldn't have to worry about Article 310 and ampacity requirements. Wouldn't be an issue, would it? So we, there's a lot of things that we need to understand about basic electricity as it applies to the code. So we're going to go through things today like single phase, three phase power. We're going to look at some uh, requirements out of Article 250 about voltage surges and, and grounding requirements. And another one is there's a lot of discussion really around the term harmonics that we probably don't pay a lot of attention to. It appears in the National Electrical Code. In fact, we're going to look at one of the requirements in the National Electrical Code where we have to consider harmonics. So let's get started. Basic electricity, right? We all understand electricity, I think. We have an electrical pressure that forces current to flow down a conductor. And so this electrical pressure, electromotive force, we call it voltage, don't we? And if we increase the voltage, we can force more volume of electricity down a given conductor. Now, I have some resistance in this conductor. Uh, I have resistance, in fact, everything, everything that that current flows through, unless it's a superconductor, I suppose, is going to have some resistance to it, some opposition to current flow. And one of the characteristics when current flows through a resistance is that it produces heat. And that heat can, of course, become an issue for us. Thus, we have our ampacity tables, for example. Another thing that happens when current flows through that resistance is, is that the voltage drops. From where the current enters that resistance to where it leaves, there's a difference in voltage between those two points. And of course, we measure that with our voltage, our voltage meter, multimeter, and uh, we measure the, the difference in voltage between two points. You see, we can't just take a test lead and stick it into a conductor somewhere and say, well, the voltage at this point is. No, we have to compare it to another point in the system. So that may be a ground or a neutral. So we'll put one test lead at one point in the system. We'll put the other test lead at another point, say, for instance, between the grounded and the ungrounded conductors. And there might be a difference of 120 volts or the difference in voltage between two different phases is 480 volts. So that brings us up to the concept of single phase versus three phase power. 
let's just draw a couple of little things out on the whiteboard and uh, we'll talk about them. And then we'll come back and look at some, some things that affect us out in the field. So let's begin with the sine wave. As voltage builds up in the system, it forces current to flow in the alternating current system. And then the voltage comes back down towards zero, goes through that zero reference point, and now forces current in the opposite direction, doesn't it? That is one complete cycle, and that's happening 60 times per second in our alternating, uh, alternating current systems here in the US. Of course, if we were to go to Europe, we'd find that'd be what? 50 cycles per second. The unit of measurement we have for that is Hertz. Now, when we take our multimeter and we measure the difference in voltage between two points, so we were to put one test lead on that zero reference line, and I suppose we could call that ground if we wanted, and put the other test lead somewhere in that sine wave, what do we read? Well, in reality, what we're reading is the RMS voltage, and that's 0 0.707 times the peak value. The actual peak value on our 120 volt signal coming over here to my receptacles is uh, about 170 volts if we were to look at it on the sine wave. But the RMS value reads 120 volts then from ground, but the RMS value then reads 120 volts on my meter. Now, we often work with three phase systems. When I have a three phase system, what our three phase system, what happens is the voltage uh, builds up on, we could call this A phase. And as the voltage builds up on A phase, when it gets to, well, about the 120 degree point on its sine wave, so this would be 0, 90, 180, 270, and 360 are back to zero again. But when we get to about this 120 degree point, then the second sine wave begins to build up. And it also occurs 60 times every second. We'll call that one B phase. And then at 120 degrees on B phase, we have current build up, don't we? And it travels, reverses direction, goes back to zero 60 times every second. And we'll call that one C phase. Now, if I were to freeze those sine waves, of course, they're all three are occurring 60 times a second in my system. If I were to just freeze those sine waves at some point in time, I don't know, pick a point right here, what's the voltage or what's the current or what's the power in the system? Well, I've got some voltage from C phase. I've got some from B phase right now. And uh, I've got quite a bit from our A phase, wouldn't it? And so how do I add those together? Well, without getting into all the, the math and the engineering of it, what we do is we multiply the phase value by 1.732, which is the square root of three. Now, what you need to understand then as the worker in the field, this is where our voltages come from. If I have a 480Y slash 277 system, which is where the code or how the code tells me to express that system, what I know is I have a Y connected transformer. And if I were to read any voltage from phase to phase, I get 480 volts with my multimeter. Whoop, not too good there, okay? I get 480 volts with my multimeter. I'm gonna have to ground the center of that Y. In any conductor I take off of the center of that Y, certainly it's a grounded conductor. And in this case, it would also be a neutral conductor. So if I read 480 between any two phases, from any phase to ground, I'm gonna read 277 volts. Or if I have 208 volts between any two phases, and I read from phase to ground, phase to neutral, I get 120 volts. And of course, we know there are a lot of applications for that out in the field. The whole advantage of three-phase power, I can deliver more energy per unit of time with three-phase power than I can just single-phase power then. Okay? So lots of advantages to three-phase power. What you need to understand is voltage and current and resistance. You need to understand that three-phase is a lot more efficient than single-phase. You need to understand the Y and the delta connection. So this is the delta connection where I take, whoops, let's do a better job of that. The delta connection is maybe <laughs> where I take uh, one, I uh, take my A, uh, C and B phases and I just connect them end to end. And uh, then I come off of here and 
Whatever I read phase to phase, I have phase to phase. Note that that transformer is not grounded. That would be an ungrounded system. I can ground it. If I wanted to get a neutral, I could come to the center of this B conductor down here and, and, and ground that. And that would be a neutral conductor then. And I could get, you know, if it were 240 phase to phase, I would get my 120 from phase to neutral. Another option that I could have is, uh, say if I didn't ground it in the center, what I could do is I could come back and ground it on the corner. And then I would have a corner grounded delta system. Now the advantage of the corner grounded delta system is it's no longer an ungrounded system. So that changes the rules that I operate under the NEC for grounding and bonding then. Well, let's go back now and talk a little bit more about Article 250. Of course, Article 250 in the National Electrical Code is on grounding and bonding. The purposes of grounding and bonding is talked about in 250.4. So if you were to look at 250.4 in your NEC, you will find that one of the, and then one of the, the major purpose that we ground the electrical distribution system. Why do we take the wires from the transformer, the windings from the transformer and connect them to the earth? And the main reason is we want to dissipate any voltage surges into the earth should they occur in our distribution system. So we're going to do that through the process of grounding them. And um, we've uh, covered that previously in a webinar and lots of information on that. That's another whole subject unto itself, grounding and bonding. But we want to be able to dissipate voltage surges into the earth. And it talks about, it says, we must have minimum impedance into the earth in that section. What is impedance? Well, we talked about resistance, but in the AC circuit, as current goes back and forth through a conductor, I build up an electromagnetic field around that conductor. And that electromagnetic field tends to induce a voltage back into the conductor that opposes the current that's trying to flow through it. So we call that a counter electromotive force or CEMF. And that opposition to current flow is part of what we call impedance. So impedance is the total opposition to current flow in the AC circuit. So we've got to keep that in mind. We're going to find that term used in the NEC then. Also, you notice in the NEC, uh, when we're talking about grounding, I can't have more than 25 ohms to ground through my ground rod into the earth, right? And if I do, it says, well, just take another ground rod, go out here at least six feet away and drive it down, and connect them together, and you'll be good to go. Why is that? What happens to resistance? If I were to take uh, two 25 ohm resistors and put them in series end to end and have current flow into the top and then out the bottom, my total resistance would be 25 ohms plus 25 ohms or 50 ohms. But if I take those same two resistors and put them in parallel, connect them across the top, now when current comes down, it can divide. It can either go through this 25 ohm resistor or could go through this 25 ohm resistor, our ground rod, right? And so what happens? What's my total resistance? Well, if you go back to Ohm's law, it's gonna be one half of the resistance of each of those ground rods in that case. If they were both 25 ohms into the ground, I would now read 12 and a half ohms into the ground. You can play with that with resistors at home. So that's resistors in parallel, very important in grounding. So also, if you think about it, when it comes to Article 250, where we talk about bonding, what do we want to have happen? We want bonding to be able to carry the fault current back to the source, the ground fault current, back to the source that flows into the metal components of our system where we don't want it, frames of enclosures and conduits and so forth. So we'll carry that fault current back to the source, and that should clear the fault by tripping the circuit breaker that's supplying our branch circuit or feeder or main, whatever it is. Now, you think about it then, just what we talked about, resistors in parallel. We might use that equipment grounding conductor, the green grounding wire, that's true. Okay, we'll often install that. What about the steel conduit? That becomes a parallel path back to the source, doesn't it? So the more paths that I can have back to the source, the better off I'm gonna be and the faster I'm gonna be able to clear ground faults. And that's definitely an advantage then of a little bit of electrical theory. The last thing I want to talk about is harmonics then. We see harmonics, especially when we start talking about the neutral conductor. And maybe that's another uh, tech talk we'll have and they, that we'll cover just the neutral conductors. But if we were to take a look in the National Electrical Code, 
Uh, oh, in uh, 310.14, for example, there's an informational note. It's talking about ampacities for conductors rated zero to 2000 volts. So their ampacity, how much current can a conductor carry under its condition of use without exceeding its temperature limitation? And there's an informational note that says, uh, when it comes to considering how much heat's gonna be generated in that conductor, it's under A3. Heat generated internally in the conductor is the result of load current flow including fundamental and harmonic currents. Oh, okay, well, I thought my load was gonna draw 20 amps. So I'll size my conductor for 20 amps. Oh no, your load happens to be the, uh, what, the copy machine in your office or something, all right? Big copy machine sitting up there. Well, one of the characteristics of electricity is, is that when current goes into a rectifier, it produces currents that flow back into the system. And where do I have these rectifiers? Everywhere. Anything that's digital, anything that's electronic in your facilities, computers, printers, variable speed drives, battery chargers, uh, laptop computers, whatever it is, okay? They all, the very first thing that happens when that current goes in is it gets changed from alternating current into DC. That rectifier then that does that produces currents that flow back into your system. But the currents that flow back into your system don't flow back in at multiples of 60, or excuse me, they don't flow back in at 60 hertz. They flow back in at multiples of 60 hertz. So for example, uh, the third harmonic would be three times 60 or 180 hertz. And, and um, in fact, let me just show you real quick. I'll show you how we measure that and what's going on. So this is a power quality analyzer. And I've got it turned on right now and you can kind of see the screen. Um, and it's got a picture of a Y connected transformer on it. So this is a device that I use out in the field to measure harmonics and all kinds of other power quality issues. But anyway, there's another topic for us on another day. huh? So let's take a look at the harmonics. I can go in here, some data that I've recorded previously and I can go into its memory and recall some data on harmonics. So here's what I see. This, this is the fundamental frequency. This is telling my total harmonic distortion. And uh, it says that 100% of my current flow is coming in at 60 Hertz right now, which is true. But then you'll notice I have down here, it's actually, a, it's hard to read, but it's the third harmonic, the fifth harmonic, the seventh harmonic, well, what is that third harmonic current doing? It's causing overheating problems on my neutral conductors, on my neutral termination back at my transformer. What's the fifth harmonic doing? Oh, it's causing inefficiencies in my motors, a counter electromotive force. That doesn't make sense to have that. I don't want that in my motors. Now, um, so I need to, and maybe some of you have been involved in installing some equipment to overcome the effects of these harmonics, harmonic filters and so forth on uh, large variable speed drives or battery chargers and so forth. How we often solve it is what? We know that that's current, that's current. And where is it flowing? It's flowing on the neutral conductor of our system. And so uh, for instance, to let's say help overcome that in an office area where we have, we have a lot of, everything's electronics, digital ballast or LEDs in the overhead, copy machine, printers, computers, and so on and so on. So what we'll do is we'll install for a lot of our receptacles, we'll run maybe some MC cable with some number 12 ungrounded conductors and a number 10 grounded conductor or neutral wire in it to help why? Carry these excessive current flows since that's where we're gonna see them primarily. So that's electrical theory. Remember, it's gonna help you to be a better professional out in the field, be no more knowledgeable about your trade, be able to make intelligent decisions when it comes to applying the National Electrical Codes and other standards and so forth. So remember this Tech Talk is brought to you by ECNM Magazine. It's part of the Endeavor Business Portfolio of Publications. I want you to go out there and above all, work safe.